Hey, uh, Tower uh, B25, uh, a chance to take a second and say something? Go ahead. This is difficult, but uh, bear with us. Um, I think from everybody here, our crew, and the entire Conley Foundation, uh, we're uh, very appreciative and deeply sorrow for uh, everything. To all of you here at the airport, to the people of Connecticut, and especially those families that involved in this tragedy this week. On a personal note, and I guess it's even more difficult because we never do it, but uh, we got to leave behind two of our friends, Mac and Mike, and uh, our brothers, our brothers and fellow crew. Also, uh, a salute to uh, our good old friend, the 909. Calling Stanley to B25 is ready for departure. Thank you very much. We'll pass the word along. We're on way six. Click for takeoff. Clear to go. Runway six, three, four, seven, six, call. Thank you, guys. Safe journeys, guys. And that's a portion of the audio from a Collings Foundation B-25 pilot talking with the tower at Bradley International near Hartford, Connecticut, and giving a tribute to the crew of the B-17 that crashed there last week, a story which we'll be talking about more in a minute. Our thanks to Live ATC for the audio. Hello again, and welcome back to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots like you to help keep you safe when you fly. I'm Max Truscott. For our main topic today, we'll be talking about GA accidents and what the latest NAL report, just released by AOPA's Air Safety Institute, tells us about the trends in general aviation accidents. And we have listener questions, including one asking about ramifications on pilots of using CBD oil and much, much more. By the way, if you have thought about maybe someday buying a Cirrus SR-20, SR-22, or SF-50 Vision Jet, or you'd like flight training in one, there is a lot I could do to help you with any of that. So please pick up the phone, give me a call today, 650-967-2500 for a free consultation and possibly a free demo flight. Now, last week in episode 123, we talked about getting pilots to speak up when they see something wrong or spot risky behavior. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. This week in the news, an update on last week's deadly crash of a B-17 in Connecticut. And the FAA just reached a milestone with ADS-B. Plus, we'll tell you about a pilot who survived an encounter with a ski area's chairlift. All this and more, and the news starts now. From the Hartford Current newspaper at Courant.com, that's C-O-U-R-A-N-T.com, the NTSB investigating whether the B-17 that crashed at Bradley International Airport had engine trouble prior to takeoff. Investigators said they're trying to determine if the World War II era plane that crashed and killed seven people and injured seven others had engine trouble prior to takeoff, a claim backed by the wife of one of the victims, who was assured by a mechanic that, quote, once they start the engine, it'll be fine. The investigation comes as U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal criticized the lack of oversight of vintage planes. He said that he has asked the NTSB to not only investigate what caused the B-17 bomber to crash at Bradley, but also to address the broader question of whether the regulations currently in place and the enforcement of them are adequate. The Boeing B-17G Flying Fortress, operated by the Collings Foundation, crashed as it tried to return to the airport after reporting engine trouble minutes after takeoff. The plane struck a de-icing facility and burst into flames, killing seven people and injuring seven others. Department of Public Safety and Emergency Services Commissioner James Rovella released the names of victims and also said that he had some concerns that the vintage plane was allowed to take off from the second largest airport in New England. The NTSB has taken over the crash site and board member Jennifer Homedy, who is overseeing this investigation, said the concerns about the B-17 bomber's engine stem from interviews with survivors of the crash. Law enforcement sources told the Courant that Collings Foundation officials were aware of a problem with at least one engine before it took off, and Deborah Riddell, the wife of Rob Riddell, said she witnessed those issues firsthand. She said that once the 10 passengers had entered the plane, the pilots were having trouble starting one of the engines. She said they brought out a black cylinder and started spraying the engine to blow out the moisture in it. She said her husband texted her from the plane that it didn't bode well, and the pilot had turned off the other engines left a seat, and walked out to check the engine. She said the mechanic told her, quote, once they start the engine, it'll be fine. Investigators are looking into the performance and fitness of the pilots, both of whom died in the crash. Hamadi said that the pilot, Ernest McCauley, 75, had 7,300 hours of flight time on the B-17. That may have made him the most experienced B-17 pilot in the nation. He's been flying for the Wings of Freedom for 20 years, and co-pilot Michael Foster, 71, has been a volunteer pilot for the Collings Foundation for five years. Amadi said that the 75-year-old's plane's last major inspection was in January. 
It could be up to 10 days before the NTSB files a report on their investigation and another 12 to 18 months before they make any determination on the crash. And I did check their website. At this point, they do not have a preliminary report posted. Hamadi said, quote, our mission is to determine what happened, why it happened, and to prevent it from happening again. Now, the Collings Foundation, of course, is one of several across the country that have sought and received a special exemption from the FAA to fly these living history airplanes since 2001. The planes are not considered commercial planes subject to stricter regulations, such as that pilots cannot fly over the age of 65, because even though people pay $450 a seat to fly on it, the money is considered a donation to the foundation. Now, McCauley, the pilot, radioed the air traffic controller just a few minutes after takeoff to say that the plane was not gaining altitude and there was trouble for the plane's number four engine. Amity said the NDSB has obtained that engine for further examination. The controller told McCauley to return and use runway six. Amity said that the plane hit the ground about a thousand feet short of the runway. The plane hit multiple stanchions, veered right over a grassy area and the taxiway, and then slammed into the airport's de-icing facility before bursting into flames sent dark columns of smoke into the air that could be seen for miles. The intense fire consumed much of the fuel-laden plane. A piece of a wing and the tail were all that was left of the bomber. FAA records show the plane, owned by a Massachusetts-based foundation, was built in 1944 and is one of 18 Boeing B-17s still registered across the U.S. The foundation purchased it in 1986 and reconfigured it from a firefighting plane to its World War II configuration. Now, here's a little information on living history exemptions. An FAA official said that historic planes such as the B-17 are eligible to operate living history flights. The plane that crashed was operating in this category, which qualified it for certain exemptions. The exemptions, the official said, allow operators to carry passengers in historical aircraft that have a limited or experimental airworthiness certificate. Exemptions are only granted when an applicant has demonstrated a public need and demonstrates that an equivalent level of safety can be achieved, the official said. In general, planes are required to undergo regular thorough investigation in order to be deemed airworthy. As bad as Wednesday's crash was, officials said it could have been worse if the plane had struck a larger commercial plane or hit a terminal building. There were several larger planes waiting to land when the distress call came from Macaulay. And I did want to mention that this week's episode of the Airplane Geeks podcast, episode 573, is about the Collings Foundation B-17, and it includes an interview with that pilot that was taken perhaps two weeks or so before the crash. And I highly recommend that you take a listen to that show if you want to learn more about the aircraft and about the people that flew it. From generalaviationnews.com, the FAA completes a final ADSB milestone. The FAA completed its final implementation milestone with ADSB, that is Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, in September when the last two of 155 airports to receive ADSB became operational. Those would be Akron Canton Airport and the Mansfield Airport, both in Ohio. Quote, this brings the operational rollout of ADSB baseline services to a successful conclusion on schedule and within budget well in advance of January 1, 2020, the date by which aircraft flying in certain controlled airspace must be equipped with a technology, FAA officials said. ADSB is now operational at ATC facilities across the country. These include airports, TRACONs, which handle busy airspace around major airports, and en route facilities, which handle the high altitude traffic and are often called centers. All are using ADSB as a preferred source of surveillance, which provides improved situational awareness to both pilots and controllers, among many other benefits and improvements, FAA officials said. ADSB also enables more accurate tracking of airplanes and airport vehicles on runways and taxiways, increasing safety and efficiency. Quote, the new system significantly improves surveillance capability in areas with geographic challenges like mountains or over water. Airplanes that are also equipped with ADSB in, which is not mandated, give pilots information through cockpit displays about their location in relation to other aircraft, bad weather and terrain, and TFR, as officials added. And I should mention that I have often heard pilots ask uh, the local controllers here if they can see them with ADSB. The answer has typically been no, but it sounds like all these facilities are now updated and can actually view aircraft's ADSB signals. From AOPA.org, the Bahamas needs you. They say that visiting the islands not affected by Hurricane Duran will help the whole country. Quote, we are asking our travel partners, like private pilots, to consider keeping their flight plans to the islands that were not affected. It's not a plea for money nor for thoughts and prayers, but for support. The best way to help the Bahamas is by traveling to the Bahamas, said Dianzio Diagular, Minister of Tourism and Aviation. Hurricane Dorian swept through the 700-island chain in September, devastating the islands of Grand Bahama and Abaco. 
Recovery is ongoing, and GA has been part of the relief programs. But the island country is more than just those two islands. Quote, we are still reeling from the devastation Hurricane Dorian brought to our beautiful, beloved country, D'Aguilar said. We have family, friends, and colleagues with ties to both Abaco and Freeport. We are praying for the safety of our countrymen. In the midst of all the devastation, we pledge continued support for our tourism industry, the key economic engine that fuels our country. The article says that tourism is the number one industry in the Bahamas and contributes about half of the country's gross domestic product. Now that the storm has passed, the country, while continuing relief efforts, is communicating that of the 16 most visited islands, 14 are open and unaffected by the hurricane. More than ever, we need you to come on vacation, Dagular said. That's the only way we can help our brothers and sisters in the north. If a hurricane would hit Jacksonville in Florida, it wouldn't mean that you wouldn't go on vacation to Miami or Fort Lauderdale, he said. That's the analogy we are making. Unfortunately, people are geographically challenged. Maintaining a robust tourism industry will be vital to help the country recover. Quote, we are grateful for the outpouring of support and love for our islands, and we would like everyone to know that the best thing they can do for us right now is to visit. Our beautiful island nation is ready for you, said Diagular. Also from AOPA.org, a policy that frees examiners of geographic limits has been extended. Now, we talked about this uh, earlier in the year. DPEs, or designated pilot examiners, can continue giving practical tests outside their assigned territories, a year after the FAA eased a policy that limited DPE travel. The FAA told AOPA it has extended guidance it gave DPEs in October 2018, authorizing them to give practical tests outside their local geographical areas without first having to request permission from their local FISDO. The geographic constraints were relaxed in response to calls from the industry to address localized examiner shortages, with the FAA noting that the longstanding limitations no longer serve the public interest. The guidance that broadened the reach of DPEs was set forth in a national policy notice the FAA circulated on October 2, 2018. The document carried an expiration date of October 2, 2019, but as that deadline approached, the FAA assured the aviation community that the more flexible policy for DPEs will continue, said Christopher Cooper, AOPA Director of Regulatory Affairs. Quote, AOPA has followed up with the FAA to verify the status of this notice and has confirmed that this policy is not going away. FAA strongly advocated for lifting DPE's geographic constraints, pointing out that the checkride bottlenecks the policy caused were exacerbating the pilot shortage while the aviation industry was undergoing rapid expansion. And yes, we have certainly had a shortage of DPEs in my local area here in Northern California, and this policy has helped us. From avweb.com, the FAA wants action on declining pilot skills. The FAA has formally requested that the International Civil Aviation Organization, otherwise known as ICAO, address the issue of declining manual flight skills among airline pilots. In a brief submitted to ICAO, the agency says pilots have become too dependent on aircraft systems and either haven't adequately learned or have not maintained their ability to manually control their aircraft, particularly during the emergencies that result in loss of the systems. When automation ceases to work properly, pilots who do not have sufficient manual control experience and proper training may be hesitant or not have enough skills to take control of the aircraft, the FAA report said. The issue has some institutional roots in that most airlines mandate the use of automated systems for almost all phases of flight. There have also been suggestions that when things go wrong, the airplanes issue so many differing alarms and alerts that pilots become overwhelmed and unable to prioritize corrective action. And also from avweb.com, another FAA story, the FAA investigating a money drop. The FAA has launched an investigation into whether a Las Vegas helicopter charter company violated safety regulations by dropping $10,000 in cash on a soccer field during a halftime promotion for the local pro team. The Skyline Helicopter Tours aircraft circled the field in the Pack Stadium for half a dozen times before dropping the cash over 200 fans picked to chase after the swirling currency. It was at least the second time the Las Vegas Lights soccer team had staged the promotion, but this time someone sent a video to the FAA. There is no rule about dropping stuff from aircraft except that it can't cause injury to anyone on the ground. Since paper money isn't dangerous from that point of view, the FAA is basing its investigation on a rule that says a pilot can't fly below an altitude allowing, if a power unit fails, an emergency landing without undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. And yes, I think when we talk with pilots about minimum safe altitudes, everybody knows you've got to stay, you know, for example, 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within 2,000 feet of you laterally if you're over a populated area. But people tend to forget that there is another part of the rule that says you can't be so low that you don't have a 
place to land so that you can deal with an emergency that occurs. And that's the issue here. The company hasn't commented, but the owner of the soccer team insists the promotion was safe. Quote, we believe they took all safety precautions necessary, said owner Brett Lashbrook. We are surprised by the FAA's incredibly subjective rule that they seem to be citing. And from AOPA.org, here's a story you'll be interested in if you use ForeFlight. If you fly more, you can win prizes using AOPA's app and ForeFlight, both offering monthly incentives. Filing flight plans with ForeFlight and checking in with the AOPA's app Pilot Passport feature will automatically put pilots in the running for monthly prize drawings starting in October. Pilots will be automatically entered to win the ForeFlight Frequent Filer sweepstakes once they file and activate a flight plan in ForeFlight. Four flight incentives include a monthly drawing for prizes, including a free one year four flight performance plus subscription, which I think is $299, as I recall, a limited edition four flight wall poster, and a four flight swag bag. Pilots are also automatically eligible for a grand prize drawing featuring an iPad Air, a four flight performance plus subscription, a Century portable ADSB receiver, and other prizes. Quote, there is no easier and more convenient way to file than with four flight, said. Stephen Newman, Executive VP of Global Sales and Marketing for ForeFlight, which is a Boeing company. Quote, you can plan, file, and brief in a matter of minutes, and then get ATC messages, quickly make amendments, and fly all with one integrated app. We are always happy to work with our partners at AOPA to equip pilots with what they need for safe and more enjoyable flying. AOPA is also offering monthly prizes for simply checking into an airport using their Pilot Passport app. Pilots can win an AOPA Pilot Gear prize pack valued at $50. AOPA will offer up a different monthly challenge through the end of the year to give active pilots more chances to win. AOPA's October Pilot Passport Challenge encourages pilots to check in at airports around the country to earn points towards state badges. The top three participants with the most state badges earned in October will be awarded a prize. And we'll include a link in our show notes here to the official rules. Both contests will run monthly until the end of 2019. Winners of the four flight frequent filer sweepstakes will be notified by mail within five days of each drawing. And to claim a prize, winners must follow the instructions contained in that notification. From KOLD.com, I'm guessing that's a TV station, the CBP tracks ultralight across border and arrests pilot. Agents from Tucson Sector Border Patrol and Tucson Air Branch Air and Marine Operations seized an ultralight aircraft and arrested the Mexican national pilot last week. AMO personnel detected an unknown aircraft just north of the international border. Helicopter crews searched for the ultralight while agents on the ground followed the aircraft's path. For nearly an hour, CPB agents tracked it until the aircraft landed along State Route 82 near Kino Springs. The aircraft appeared damaged from the landing and abandoned by its pilot. Agents found the pilot hiding in a nearby wash. The 39-year-old pilot, illegally present in the country, will be held for immigration violations. This is the second ultralight seized by CPB in the last year. On May 23rd, a similar aircraft with nearly 150 pounds of synthetic narcotics was found in a similar smuggling event. However, no arrests were made in connection to that seizure. And finally, from ibtimes.com, plane crashes into ski lift cable, pilots and passengers evade death. A pilot and a passenger nearly escaped death after they were left dangling upside down, trapped inside their aircraft, which crashed into a ski lift cable in the Italian Alps on Sunday, October 6th. The incident took place in Prato Valentino Ski Resort at Teglio, north of Milan in the Italian Alps. The overhead cables in the resort of Lombardy, Italy, seized the light aircraft and left it upturned. Took about 90 minutes for rescuers to bring down the pair from the jeopardized aircraft. According to a rescuer, it was nothing short of a miracle that they came out unhurt. The pilot, 62, didn't suffer serious injuries and he was sent to a hospital in Sondalo. The 55 year old tourist from Varese, who was aboard the aircraft, escaped unharmed as well. Dramatic images released by the rescue team show the pilot sitting on the wing as a rescuer meticulously advances toward him along the cable. And I've seen that photo, by the way. The plane is upside down, hanging from the cable between two chairs on a chairlift, and the pilot is sitting on what would be the underside of the wing, which works, of course, because the plane was then upside down. Mountain rescue teams, the firefighters, and the police joined hands to carry out the complex rescue operation. They were able to successfully remove both the men from the aircraft after two hours of effort. Quote, they were both really lucky. If the plane had crashed into the ground, the ending could have been very different. It was a complicated rescue operation involving Many services, but ultimately it was successful, which was the main thing. Neither of the men were injured, but they were very shocked, said Walter Milan, a spokesman for the National Cave and Mountain Rescue Unit. 
It was a miraculous escape. The plane crashed into the cables, but fortunately it became stuck rather than crashing to the ground. Officials stated that the plane had taken off from a nearby airfield for a sightseeing tour. It then lost power and crashed. There are speculations about probable reasons, both human and mechanical, for the crash. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get to our main topic, talking about general aviation safety and the latest NAL report. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Well, last week in episode 123, I said I'd like to start doing fun flying destinations on a regular basis. And I've got one I'm going to play for you here in a moment that came from a listener, Brett. But first, let me tell you about a fun flying destination I went to this past weekend. I was with my family on a short vacation. We went to the Grand Canyon. I have never been to the Grand Canyon. Hard to believe. I've flown by it, looked at it as I've gone by in a general aviation aircraft, but never been down there on the rim. So we flew commercially into uh, Phoenix and then drove about three and a half hours up to the park. But let me tell you a little bit about some of the things you can do from a general aviation uh, standpoint. Uh, We stayed in a hotel that was less than a mile from uh, Grand Canyon uh, National Airport, uh, which is KGCN, which is uh, fairly close to the national park. And I did go out to that airport and you can definitely fly into there. And I did a great canyon sightseeing tour from there. They have a lot of companies there that do both helicopter and aircraft rides. I decided to do the aircraft ride. Uh, One, it was a little less expensive, but two, it looked like it covered a larger area. And so I got really lucky. I went to Grand Canyon Airways and for $159, got a 40-minute trip. And they put me up in the front seat, right there in the co-pilot seat of a Cessna Caravan equipped with a G-1000, which is the exact plane that I went through uh, training at flight safety for mm, probably about 10 years ago. I've got probably about 80 hours in that aircraft. So it was fun to be back in one of those planes. And we flew along, I think, about 9,000 feet most of the time. Now, if you're unfamiliar with flying in that area, there is a special flight rules area. And there's a separate map called the Grand Canyon National Park Special Flight Rules Area. And there are large portions of that area where you have to be above 14,500 feet. It's a no-fly zone below that. There are a couple areas where you can cut across the canyon and get as low as 10,500 feet. And those are you know, pretty much going straight across the canyon. You can't go you know, up the canyon, and you certainly can't be below the canyon rim. Now, we were at uh, 9,000 feet, so we were below all of those uh, you know, areas that GA aircraft could transit. And we were on autopilot and basically following another aircraft uh, that was ahead of us along a pre-programmed route that they had put into the the Garmin G1000 flight plan. Now, I'll go ahead and include a link to the map so that you can take a look and see what the special flight rules area looks like. Now, the helicopters look like they were flying on average about 1,500 feet below us at around 7,500 feet. I think they were doing a shorter route and they were a a little bit more expensive to do those tours. And I was just looking around to see what articles I could find about sightseeing flights. I wish I had seen this before I went. It was a great article by David Toulis, and I really was impressed with the work that he did at AOPA last year relative to hurricane coverage, both with the hurricanes in Texas and in Florida. He had probably the best comprehensive articles uh, that I could find anywhere. But David wrote a really nice story about uh, going with his family. He said he researched all the rides. He found a helicopter ride that I believe went down into the canyon and you know, landed somewhere. Also uh, went uh, over the north rim where that large uh, walkway is that you could you know, walk out over the canyon and look down through your feet and see the canyon. So it uh, sounds like a great tour. I'll include a link to that article as well in the show notes. Now, another good way to see the canyon would be uh, by train. If you go to Williams, Arizona, from there, you can take a train which goes up to the Grand Canyon, hangs out there for, I don't know, a few hours, I guess, and then turns around and goes back. But all in all, it looked like one heck of a lot of fun. My kids went hiking down the canyon. I did a little hiking as well, too. I really enjoyed it. So I'm looking forward to going back to the Grand Canyon. I'm thinking next time I may just fly the family via GA into the Grand Canyon National Airport. Now let's take a listen to uh, Brett's fun flying destination. Hi, Max. This is Brett Chilcott in Kansas. In a recent episode, you asked us to submit information about fun places to fly. One of our favorite places to fly is at Beaumont, Kansas. It's about 60 miles east of Wichita. The identifier is 07S. Beaumont, Kansas is a small town population around 100 people, and there's a grass runway that you can land in a pasture. 
you taxi up to a road and taxi into town. Uh, this got a great cafe and an old hotel there. And we recently held our International Stinson Summit there. I encourage your listeners to check it out. It's a fun place to go at Beaumont, Kansas. They have a website, beaumonthotel.ks. And also on the uh, YouTube, I have a bunch of personal videos that I've uh, submitted where I take uh, people for anniversaries and birthdays uh, as a celebration. Again, Beaumont, Kansas, east of Wichita, identifier 07S, a really fun place to go. Keep up the good work, Max. Thanks. Brett, thanks so much for sharing that. This sounds really like a lot of fun. I went to the website for the hotel, and wouldn't you know they've got a picture of a steerman right there in front of the hotel. It sounds like a fun place to go. I'm going to include a link in the show notes. You can find the uh, Beaumont Hotel at beaumonthotelks.com. And also, I put a link to the airnav.com link to the uh, 07S, which is the Beaumont Hotel Airport in Beaumont, Kansas. Thanks so much. And if you have a fun flying destination, please go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener question at the top, and you can use that as an easy way to record. Otherwise, just go ahead and record on your smartphone using voice memos and then email it to me at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com. Hey, speaking of Kansas, I'm going to be out there soon. I'm going to have a listener meetup on October the 30th in the evening, probably around 5 p.m., and it's going to be southwest of Kansas City, Missouri, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of Olathe, Kansas, or Overland Park, Kansas, somewhere in that uh, neighborhood. So if you are interested in coming out to say hello, I'm thinking we might go to a local Starbucks for an hour and hang out in the evening, uh, just go ahead and send me an email. Uh, go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page, and hope to see you in Kansas. Now, speaking of other fun events coming up, Patty Wagstaff is a very well-known aerobatic uh, pilot, and she is going to be featured at a banquet on uh, Saturday, November 16th at uh, San Carlos, California. Now, that's going to be hosted by the Aero Club of Northern California. I'm the former president there. And basically, we have the Crystal Eagle Award, which is a massive trophy, uh, lovely Italian crystal uh, eagle mounted on a redwood block. And that award has gone to a lot of extremely well-known people in aviation. This year, it's going to Patty Wagstaff. So if you're interested in coming out and meeting her and participating in the banquet, I'll go ahead and put a link in the show notes so where you can register to uh, attend that dinner. So that's going to be Saturday, November 16th at the Hiller Aviation Institute, Hiller Museum in San Carlos, California. And here's a note that came from Chris. Chris wrote to me and said, Max, I have recently filed a petition for rulemaking at the FAA asking the administrator to begin a rulemaking process to repeal the VOR test logging rule. Now, I'm sure listeners who are IFR rated Know what that is? It means that in order to be legally able to fly IFR, you must in the past 30 days have done a VOR test and you have to have logged the information about the test. Let's see, four things, the location, the date, the bearing air, and your signature. Anyway, he says uh, he'd like to have me mention it on the show. He said he's been working with AOPA and he's hoping that they will submit supportive comments. He notes, I am not asking the FAA to dispense with the actual VOR testing requirement just the rule that such tests be logged every 30 days in the aircraft. Basically, I think this is the easiest thing for the FAA to do and the most burdensome part of the actual testing process. So there's a link here to where you can find his petition. I'll go ahead and include a link in the show notes. But basically, he's saying, uh, gosh, let's go ahead and require the test, but not have to do the logging every 30 days of the test. And uh, he's also asking for comments. He says a suggested text for comments uh, you might write something like, I am writing to express my support for opening a rulemaking proceeding regarding the potential repeal of the VOR test logging requirement. This rule has outlived its usefulness and creates an unnecessary burden upon pilots and aircraft owners and operators. And we'll include a link to that in the show notes. Chris, thanks so much for sending that along. And if you've ever wondered why on each news show I talk briefly about Patreon and PayPal, it's because this is a listener-supported show, and every month we lose a few supporters, and so that's why we're trying to gain them back. So if you've thought about supporting the show, today would be a great time to uh, do that. We lost a couple of listeners this past week and would love to replace them. Some of the new folks that did come to join us, first of all, thanks to a new super supporter, Rob Miller, who's contributing via PayPal, and then folks who've signed up via Patreon First of all, I'd like to mention Christian. I forgot to read his name last week, so I apologize for that. But also we have William Fellon, Ryan Nelson, Ernie Walker, and Dale Thompson, who have all signed up. 
Now, we also have eight mega supporters, folks who contribute more than $50 a month, and I mention them every news show. They include Tyson Weiss, who's the co-founder of Forflight, which, of course, is now a division of Boeing, Victor Vogel, who lives in central PA and flies a Cirrus, Tim Delaney here in Northern California. He's been flying almost 50 years and flies an SR-22. Stephen Elop, who flies a turbocharged 182 and a Citation M2. He's now the CEO of API Jet. Larry Noe from New York City. He flies a Cirrus SR-22. Mike Williams, president of Kiomac and TCB Composite, which makes the composite spinners and bulkheads for GA aircraft. Seth Lake, who we had on the show recently. He's a new DPE, giving check rides, specializing in the multi-engine rating. You can find out about his flight school at vsl.aero. And Rick Miller, he instructs in the Cincinnati area, both out of Lunkin Flight Training Center, and he would love to teach full-time, but he still has a day job. So check him out if you're interested in flying in that area, Piper, Cessnas, Beechcraft, and Cicadas. If you'd like to send a one-time donation or a monthly donation via PayPal, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal, or sign up for a monthly contribution via Patreon at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Now, if you do choose to join us via Patreon, you will get a few extra goodies. For example, at the $4 month level, supporters get copies of the scripts for our new shows. And at the $8 month level, supporters get the scripts plus a list of links of all the stories we didn't cover in the news because of time constraints. So, for example, this week, I think we've probably had six or eight stories that didn't make it into the news. And for all of our super supporters who donate $20 a month, they are listed in our show notes for every new show. Now, in a moment, we'll be talking about general aviation safety and the 28th annual NAW report right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now, let's talk about general aviation accidents. If you're a pilot, you are most likely a student of aircraft accidents, because one thing we know for sure is that the accidents that pilots will have in the future, well, they're going to be pretty much the same as the accidents we've had in the past. And that's because we are not inventing new ways to kill ourselves. We're doing it pretty much the same way we've done it for decades. So if you learn a lot about past accidents, you can avoid many future accidents. And here's more good news when you think about it. Approximately 80% of all aircraft accidents are a result of pilot error or judgment. So if you can become very familiar with the ways that pilots crash and you work hard not to crash in any of those ways, you'll substantially lower your own personal risk when you fly. So if you're a student pilot or thinking about becoming a pilot, plan to spend a lot of time during your lifetime as a pilot studying aircraft accidents. And if you're a pilot now, but you really don't care much about learning about aircraft accidents, well, I'd like to suggest that learning all you can about accidents is relatively cheap insurance that makes you safer when you fly. Now, there are several great sources of information about aircraft accidents. One is the NTSB database, which is now a little harder to find on their website than it used to be. So I'll include a link in the show notes so that you can get to it directly. I particularly like their query form where you can enter different parameters for searching the database. For example, you can specify a range of dates that you want to search. Uh, you can ask whether the accident was fatal or not, the state or country in which the accident occurred, the airport at which it occurred, and so on. And you can also search by keywords that happen to appear anywhere in the report. So with all these powerful search capabilities, you can easily locate one particular accident of interest, or just a whole set of accidents that meet a particular criteria. And I've used the NTSB database extensively in the past to find either a specific accident I wanted to read about, or to find all of the accidents of a particular type. For example, I've done searches on accidents here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then further refined that to look just at night accidents, or in another case, just weather-related accidents in the area. I also wanted to search using keywords such as recently purchased and recently bought, to learn about pilots who crashed their aircraft on the trip home after buying an airplane or who crashed soon after they bought their aircraft. So the NTSB database is just a treasure trove of data, but it doesn't summarize the data for you. You need to search, find the reports, and read them, and then do your own analysis to draw conclusions. NASA also has a database of reports on aircraft incidents and potential accidents, which is part of the ASRS, or Aviation Safety Reporting Program. This is the group that handles what pilots refer to as the NASA form, which pilots file whenever they have a safety-related issue that they'd like to report. The program was set up years ago so that pilots can anonymously report safety issues without fear that they'll get in trouble from the FAA after reporting it. And NASA has an online database of all these reports so you can search to learn about safety issues that pilots have reported. 
a large number of the reports are for the airline industry, but there are a substantial number of reports in the system for GA pilots. So while this database doesn't focus on accidents as the NTSB database does, it does highlight safety issues which could lead to an accident. And again, I'll include a link to this database in the show notes. A third great source of aviation accident information is the Joseph T. Null Report, which is prepared by AOPA's Air Safety Institute and funded through donations to the AOPA Foundation. The 28th Null Report came out this week, and I'll be sharing with you some of the data from that report. Now, you can find Null Reports online at aopa.org going back to the 1997 Null Report. Years ago, the reports included more narrative text and analysis than they do now, but I imagine that got a little bit expensive to produce. So the more recent null reports have all the data and all the graphs found in older reports, which is certainly the most important part of the report, but they have a little bit less analysis than the older reports. Now, the current report is divided into six sections, which are introduction, non-commercial fixed wing, commercial fixed wing, non-commercial helicopter, commercial helicopter, and experimental aircraft. We'll focus today primarily on the non-commercial fixed wing section and briefly talk about experimental aircraft, which is a fairly short section. The introduction section has a great section called, What is General Aviation? And I think that's important because a lot of people don't really know what is and is not included in GA. And not all sources agree on the definition of GA. For example, if you look at Wikipedia, it has a much more narrow definition of GA than what I'm about to give you. Here's how the 28th Null Report defines GA. GA is all flight activity of every kind except that done by the Uniformed Armed Services, so that's the military, and scheduled airlines. In addition to personal and recreational flying, it includes public benefit missions such as law enforcement and fire suppression, flight instruction, freight hauling, passenger charters, crop dusting, and other types of aerial work that range from news reporting to helicopter sling loads. Then the Null Report talks about which accidents are included in the report. It says, the 28th Null Report analyzes GA accidents in the U.S. national airspace and on flights departing from or returning to the U.S. or its territories or possessions. The report covers airplanes with maximum rate of gross takeoff weights of 12,500 pounds or less and helicopters of all sizes. Collectively, these types of aircraft account for 99% of GA flight activity. Other categories are excluded, including gliders, weight shift control aircraft, powered parachutes, gyrocopters, and lighter-than-air aircraft of all types. Due to the nature of accident investigations, specifically fatal accidents, the NTSB requires substantial time and resources to investigate accidents. The Air Safety Institute's Null Report covers the most recent year for which probable cause has been determined in at least 80% of the accidents. Now, here's a really key point they make. The total number of accidents nationwide can vary substantially from year to year. For that reason, the most informative measure is usually not the number of accidents, but the accident rate, which is commonly expressed as the number of accidents per 100,000 flight hours. GA flight time is estimated using the FAA's annual GA and Part 135 activity survey, which breaks down aircraft activity by category and class and purpose of flight, among other characteristics. Now, if you've been a pilot for a long time, you may have received a copy of the GA and Part 135 activity survey in the mail from the FAA. I know I received the survey one year. It's rather long and it asks pilots to report their total number of hours flown for the prior year, and you're requested to break down your flying hours into a lot of different categories depending upon the type of aircraft you were flying and the purpose of those flights. And as the Null Report says, the best measure is the accident rate, which is the total number of accidents divided by the total number of hours flown. And the total number of hours in most cases comes from that FAA, GA, and Part 135 activity survey. And in my opinion, that survey data is the greatest source of error in calculating accident rates because we can easily count the number of accidents, but in most cases we only have an estimate of the total number of hours flown I think it would be easy for that data to be off by at least several percentage points. And I don't think anyone calculates a confidence interval for that survey data, so we really have no idea how accurate that survey data is, but it's the only thing we have, so that's what's used. By the way, some manufacturers can more accurately calculate the accident rate for their aircraft. For example, Cirrus requires all service centers to report back the total time on the Hobbs meter for each aircraft when it's serviced, which is substantially all the aircraft in the fleet. So they have actual data and don't have to rely on just survey data of a small sample of the total fleet, which is what the FAA relies on when they do their survey. Getting back to the Null Report, they say that the 2016 total accident count was 1,214. 195 of those accidents were fatal accidents, resulting in 346 fatalities. Now let me do some quick math here. If we take 195 and divide by 1214, then the percentage of accidents in which at least one person on board dies is 16.1%. So about one in six aircraft accidents are fatal. 
and that's down slightly from 20 years ago. I remember doing analysis then which showed that 15% of daytime accidents were fatal and 30% of nighttime accidents were fatal. And I recall that 21% of all accidents occurred at night. Now, I just did a weighted average of those numbers. It says that back then, 18% of accidents resulted in a fatality. So the odds of an accident being fatal have gone down a couple of percent over the last 20 years. The NAR report continues, while the number of total accidents increased from 2015 to 2016, the number of fatal accidents declined by 11%, down from 221 in 2015 to 195 in 2016. Now, that's very interesting. The total number of accidents went up in 2016, but the number of those accidents which were fatal went down, which is good. Continuing the report says, while some areas are not improving as quickly as others, the overall fatal accident trend shows a large reduction and simultaneously an increase in GA activity, that is the total flight hours flown. The FAA estimates 2016 flight time at 24.64 million flight hours compared to 23.98 million flight hours in 2015. From here on, the null report breaks the accidents down into different categories. We're going to focus mostly on the non-commercial fixed-wing category, since I think that's of the most interest to you, and because it covers the lion's share of the accidents. For example, the total number of accidents in this category was 1,036, compared to a total of 1,214 for all categories. So non-commercial fixed-wing category represents about 85% of all the accidents. By the way, there were 159 fatal accidents in this category, so 15.3% of non-commercial fixed-wing aircraft accidents had at least one fatality on board. Now, there are a lot of charts and graphs in the report, and I'm going to jump down to one which looks at the accident rate over the last 10 years. Again, this is just for non-commercial fixed-wing aircraft accidents. It has two lines on it, one that shows what happened to the total accident rate over the last 10 years, and another line that shows how the fatal accident rate has changed over that time period. In 2007, the total accident rate was estimated to be 6.54 accidents for every 100,000 hours flown. Now, if you do the math, that suggests that on average, for every 15,290 hours a pilot flies, he or she would have one accident. Now, 15,000 hours between accidents might seem like a lot to you, but I have approximately 10,000 hours of total flight time, so I'm already two-thirds of the way toward 15,000 hours. Now, this statistic doesn't mean that in 5,000 hours I'll have an accident. Hopefully I won't because I've spent a lot of time studying accidents, so I like to think I'm less likely than the average pilot to have an accident. And there is a major way in which my flying differs from that of typical pilots, which predicts that actually I should have a lower accident rate, and I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. So in 2007, total accident rate was 6.54 accidents for every 100,000 hours, and five years later in 2012, it was virtually unchanged at 6.55 accidents for every 100,000 hours. But over the next five years, the rate did decrease, probably buoyed by an increase in the number of pilot hours flown as we came out of the recession of 2009. The drop over that time has been fairly consistent, and in the last five years, the total accident rate has dropped from 6.55 accidents all the way down to 5.67 accidents for every 100,000 hours flown. Another way of looking at that is instead of pilots having an accident on average once every 15,290 hours, they're now having accidents once every 17,630 hours. Now let's look at the trends in the fatal accident rate. In 2007, the fatal accident rate was estimated to be 1.21 accidents for every 100,000 hours flown. And if you do that math, it suggests that on average for every 82,640 hours a pilot flies, he or she would have one fatal accident. Now like the total accident rate, the fatal accident rate remained virtually unchanged through 2012 when it was a virtually identical 1.23 fatal accidents for every 100,000 hours flown. And over the last five years, that rate has dropped substantially. In 2016, the fatal accident rate was 0.87 fatal accidents per 100,000 hours flown. So now on average for every 114,900 hours a pilot flies, he or she would have one fatal accident. And if you look at that entire 10-year period, the total accident rate has dropped by 13.3%, while the fatal accident rate has dropped by 28.1%. Now, the majority of accidents and fatal accidents were in single-engine fixed-gear aircraft. That is 780 total accidents and 104 fatal accidents, respectively. And while single-engine fixed-gear aircraft accounted for a larger percent of the accidents, multi-engine aircraft have a much higher lethality rate, that is, the percentage of accidents that are fatal. I think these statistics are closely correlated with speed. In general, the faster the aircraft, the more likely an accident is to be fatal. And I think that's because the kinetic energy of an aircraft, which is the total amount of energy that it has to dissipate when you crash into the ground, is a function of the square of the speed. So if an aircraft hits the ground twice as fast, well, four times the total energy gets dissipated, which means there's a lot more force tearing at your body 
it's going to be four times as great, which means greater chance of injury or death. So here are the percentages of accidents in each class of aircraft that were fatal. In single-engine fixed-gear aircraft, 13.1% of all accidents were fatal. In single-engine fixed-gear tailwheel aircraft, 11.4% of all accidents were fatal. And, you know, most of the tailwheel aircraft I see in our traffic pattern are slower than other aircraft, so that makes sense. In single-engine retractable gear aircraft, 22.3% of all accidents were fatal. And in multi-engine aircraft, 24.4% of all accidents were fatal. So it's pretty clear if you're going to have an accident, it's less likely to be fatal if you're in a slower aircraft, such as a single-engine fixed-gear or single-engine tailwheel aircraft. Now, here's an interesting fact, which is that instructional flight, like the kind that I'm doing about 99% of the time, instructional flight is significantly safer than both personal flying and business flights. Now, this null report didn't calculate the percentage of fatal accidents for each of these categories, but they did provide the raw data, so I was able to calculate it for you. The vast majority of accidents, 780, were for personal flight, and 127 of these were fatal. So I calculated that 16.3% of personal flight accidents included a fatality on board. By contrast, instructional flight, where there's a CFI on board, has a much lower fatal accident rate. In 2016, there were a total of 181 of these accidents, and only 16 of them were fatal. So I calculated that 8.8% of instructional flight accidents include fatalities on board, which is about half the rate for personal flying. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Most of these flights are short in nature, are conducted in the daytime, and in reasonably good weather. Plus, there's a second person in the airplane, the CFI, who's highly motivated to get home safely every night. At least I know I am. For business flights, there were 23 accidents, so relatively few total accidents, probably because these flights are often flown by professional pilots. And of these, four were fatal, or 17.4% of the business flights, which is actually slightly worse than the personal flying rate, probably because so many business flights are conducted in faster, often multi-engine aircraft. Now let's look at the day versus night fatal accident rate. If you look at all of the daytime accidents, 13.8% of them were fatal, almost identical to what it was 20 years ago. And if you add up all the night accidents, 29.9% of them were fatal, again, unchanged from 20 years ago. And I'm familiar with that data, having given a night flying safety seminar at least 50 times, including to large audiences at AirVenture and Oshkosh. So one thing you might want to try to do is rearrange your schedule so that most of your flying is during the daytime. Because if you did happen to have an accident, the chance of that accident being fatal is less than half of what it would be if you were flying at night. And by the way, in 2016, there were five night IFR accidents, and all five of them were fatal. Now let's look at the different types of accidents that pilots had. The most common accident type was a landing accident. No surprise, landings are the most difficult thing we do in an airplane. An all report says that a total of 755 accidents were caused by the pilot, and of these, 334, or 44% of the total, were landing accidents. The only good news, as I see it, is that when you're landing, you're slow, and so only six of these 334 accidents were fatal. So when you have a landing accident, pretty good chance that you're going to survive it. There were a total of 121 takeoff and climb accidents, and 24 of these were fatal. There were 63 fuel management accidents. Seven of those were fatal. And there were 43 maneuvering-related accidents, and 25 of these, or 58%, were fatal. Maneuvering accidents typically occur close to the ground, and many of them occur in the traffic pattern. Many of these are loss of control, which the NTSB says is the most frequent type of GA accident. The NTSB points to multiple reasons for loss of control, including pilot distraction, loss of situational awareness, or weather, uh, but said the most common type involved a stall. And distractions? Well, we talked about that as our main topic way back a couple of years ago in episode five of the Aviation News Talk podcast. So if you haven't heard it, you may want to go to aviationnewstalk.com slash five, and I'll include a link to that in the show notes. And if you look at the descent and approach phase of flight, 38 accidents occurred, 11 of which were fatal. And there were also 23 weather-related accidents, of which 12 or just over half were fatal. But the big news about weather accidents, and this was kind of a surprise to me, is there's been a sharp decline in them over the last 10 years. In 2007, there were 56 weather-related accidents, and 44 of them were fatal, which meant that 78% of those accidents were fatal back then. Now, 10 years later, we have just 23 weather-related accidents, a decline of 59%, and instead of 78% of them being fatal, in 2016, just 52% of them were fatal. So why the big change, you might ask? The null report doesn't offer a reason, but I can suggest a couple possibilities. During that 10-year period, we've seen a tremendous increase in in-flight weather capability in the cockpit, either with 
Sirius XM Weather, or the Fist B Weather provided through ADSB. Also in 2007, we didn't have powerful pre-flight planning apps like ForeFlight and Garmin Pilot, so it's now easier for pilots to determine what the weather looks like before they take off. And I think there's one other major factor, and that's the increase in the number of excellent autopilots that are now found in newer aircraft and which can be easily retrofitted into older aircraft. And we'll talk more about autopilots in a future show. By the way, if you break down the weather-related accidents, 13 of them were VFR into IMC, where a pilot flew into a cloud. Four were turbulence, three were thunderstorms, two were poor IFR technique, and one was icing-related. Now, finally, there was another category, and the majority of which were made up by loss of power accidents, of which there were 54 total accidents, five of which were fatal. So that's the non-commercial fixed-wing category, which accounts for most of the GA accidents. Now let's turn briefly to the experimental and light sport aircraft category. The big story is that the number of accidents and fatal accidents have sharply declined over the past 10 years. I remember that perhaps five or six years ago, there was a recognition in the industry that experimental aircraft had a higher accident rate than certificated aircraft, and there was a big push by EAA in particular to educate experimental pilots to try and reduce the accident rate. In 2007, there were a total of 228 accidents for fixed-wing amateur-built aircraft, and 56 of those accidents, or 24.6%, were fatal. Note that's considerably higher than the single-engine fixed-gear aircraft rate that we talked about earlier, where just 13.1% of the accidents were fatal. Ten years later, in 2016, there were a total of 160 accidents and 30 fatal accidents in fixed-wing amateur-built aircraft. So in 2016, the percentage of accidents that were fatal was just 18.4%, which is significantly better. Overall, over 10 years, the total number of fixed-wing amateur-built aircraft accidents is down by 28%, and the number of fatal accidents is down by 46%. Now, one big difference in this category is that the largest percentage of accidents were mechanical failures, and that accounted for 26.2% of all accidents. You'll recall that for certificated aircraft, the largest category by far was landing accidents. And for experimental aircraft, the second largest cause is landing accidents, which accounted for 20.2% of the total accidents. So there you have it, a summary of some of the key findings in the 28th Annual NAW Report. Of course, there's much more data in the report that we could cover in this episode, so I've included a link to that report in the show notes so you can read through the entire report yourself if you'd like. Coming up next, listener questions right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And I got a lot of feedback from episode 120, which was on troubleshooting radio and audio panel problems. Here's a note from Dan in New Hampshire. He says, ran into something for the first time this weekend, CTAF and AWOS on the same frequency. So CTAF would be the common traffic advisory frequency that pilots self-announce on at non-towered airports. AWOS would be the automated weather service at those airports. He says, to activate the AWOS, click the mic three or five times, not sure which, and it transmits one cycle of the data. I've never heard of this, and the activation process is not noted in the AFD, the Airport Facility Directory. Might be useful to pass this on in one of your podcasts if you're addressing a topic. The particular airport I was at was Greenville, Maine, which is 3 Bravo 1. Perhaps this is common knowledge, but I've never heard about it. No, I haven't either. So thanks so much for passing that along, Dan. And here's an email from Joe in California. He says, hey, Max, just finished listening to your episode on troubleshooting radios. I was flying around SoCal a while back, and I heard a controller come up on guard requesting those on frequency such and such to check for a stuck mic. I thought that was pretty clever. Enjoy your shows much. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. So he was transmitting on 121.5, trying to reach someone who had a stuck mic. I'll tell you what's not so clever about that. When you're transmitting you can't hear anything uh, in the airplane. So even though the controller was trying to reach somebody at a different frequency, people in the airplane would not have been able to hear that while their microphone was still stuck. And here's an email from Peter of uh, PS Engineering in Tennessee. He says, I particularly enjoyed the episode on troubleshooting radio and audio issues. Very thorough and informative as always. However, I didn't hear a suggestion on what to do if an actual audio panel failure occurs. He says there's a simple but perhaps little known remedy I didn't realize this until I started working in the industry. Most audio panels can be placed in a fail-safe mode by simply turning them off or by pulling the fuse or circuit breaker of a remote panel. This connects the pilot to the COM1 radio, and I think what it means is it connects the pilot's headset to the COM1 radio via mechanical relays bypassing the audio panel completely. Of course, the intercom no longer works, but at least the pilot can communicate with the outside world. This is true of all PS engineering panels, and I'm pretty sure Garmin as well. 
Well, thanks so much for that. That's uh, good information, Peter. And here is an email from Jeremy of uh, Northern California. He says, and this one was really kind of intriguing. I was approaching one of our local airports, my home airport of San Carlos. As you are likely aware, they often have one controller running both the tower and the ground positions and thus transmit on both frequencies simultaneously. As I was passing over Coyote Hills, I heard the tower, but heard only silence in response. That is, I could tell they keyed up, but there was no discernible audio. I could hear other traffic on the frequency. I repeated my call, and this time I could barely hear him addressing my call sign, but there seemed to be so little modulation I couldn't make out anything more. I immediately switched over to COM2, assuming some odd problem had occurred in my COM1 radio. When I switched to the audio panel, I instantly saw what had happened. I had accidentally failed to turn off COM2 monitor after having picked up the ATIS and flip-flopping back to the ground. As an electrical engineer like you, Max, I instantly realized what was up. I've since retested this theory at San Carlos and have determined that their microphones in the tower are connected in relatively backwards polarity in these two positions. And if you listen to the tower and the ground simultaneously, it allows the audio signals to mix and effectively cancel each other out if you have the volume set equally. At other airports, I've tested this and the same mistake can cause an overdriven distorted sound from the additive effect of the two signals when they are in phase lesson learned. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I've never thought about that, but essentially uh, somehow those two radios are out of phase with each other. And the issue could be, as you suggested, with uh, connections uh, in the uh, tower at San Carlos, or quite possibly it could be in your own radio, the way the outputs of COM1 and COM2 are routed to the audio panel. So fascinating. And he also says, uh, I added to my pre-flight passenger briefing for new passengers to be aware of the hiss sound caused on the intercom when they inadvertently have their microphones in the air vent stream as this makes it very hard for me to hear the radio. Yes, absolutely. Good tips there. Thanks so much for your email. And here's one other comment that I got related to this show from Paris. He's one of our supporters. I saw him at a seminar I was teaching recently. He said that if you look at the headset microphones, those are typically covered in a windscreen, a foam windscreen. And he said it might not be obvious, but it could be twisted out of position. So he said you need to remove the foam to see for sure twist the microphone around if necessary so that the mic element is pointed toward your lips and then put the foam windscreen back on. So thanks so much for that, Paris. Really good point. I've uh, actually done that before. Sometimes you can actually squeeze through the foam with your fingers and kind of feel uh, which direction the, uh, the microphone is pointed at. Now let's go to listener questions. This comes from Todd, who's one of our Patreon supporters. He said, I had a question about pilots consuming CBD oil. Uh, now, this is something I didn't know much about, so I had to do some research. He says, CBD is one of the latest and greatest health hypes going across the country. My concern is if you get what they call the full spectrum CBD oil, it has a very small amount of THC in the oil. This could make you fail a drug test. And you do a blood test, anyone could tell that you are not smoking or ingesting marijuana because the THC in your blood will be hundreds of times less. I would assume if the FAA were to check a pilot who was taking CBD, that the pilot could be in trouble. I was hoping you might have read or heard about this issue. If so, what have you found out? Thanks for your time. So, uh, Todd, I actually called AOPA as well as uh, did some research online here. I talked with uh, Jackie in the medical group of the uh, Pilot Information Center. She said that uh, CBD oil is not allowed by the FAA, but she said it's also not a routine part of FAA medical. So in other words, when you do the urine test, they're not looking for drugs. And so the FAA wouldn't be requiring any drug testing in a typical medical unless they had uh, some other you know, evidence that there was a drug issue and therefore required it. So routinely, you don't get drug tested as part of a first, second, or third class medical. Now, there was an interesting article that I found here in the FAA safety briefing from the May-June uh, 2019 issue. And in it, Dr. Michael Berry, who is a federal air surgeon, says, more recently, interest has grown in other compounds derived from the cannabis plant that may have positive health benefits, but without mind-altering features of THC. One such compound being widely marketed is CBD oil. In 2018, the FDA announced the approval of, let's see, cannabid oil, I guess, a purified grade CBD extract from the cannabis plant for the treatment of seizures associated with two rare and severe forms of epilepsy. As a FDA-approved medicine, it is subject to strict quality control. In other words, you know what you are getting. Commercially available CBD, by contrast, the stuff you'd buy over the counter, is not regulated and may be contaminated with a variety of substances, most significantly THC. Product labels are often inaccurate. Although most CBD products claim to have under 0.3% THC, 
they could contain high enough levels of THC to make a drug test positive. Use of CBD oil is not accepted as an affirmative defense against a positive drug test. Now, Todd was asking this from the perspective of a private pilot, but if you were a commercial pilot, or more specifically, if you worked in the aviation industry, this is going to be relevant to you. This comes from AOPA under their Pilot Protection Services. They are answering a question which says, do I need to submit to drug testing or do I need to be part of an organized drug testing program? They say the answer is straightforward. Anyone who performs a safety-sensitive function for compensation as a pilot or mechanic is subject to DOT slash FAA drug testing. Even a small Part 135 charter operation with one aircraft and one pilot is required to be involved with some form of drug testing program. Any mechanic who signs off the logs for work on an aircraft being used for Part 135 operations is required to be on a formal FAA drug testing program. Anyone training for either of these functions is also required to be enrolled in a former drug testing program before their training begins. And they say a DOT FAA drug test is not the same as state-mandated drug-free work zone drug test. A hair test performed by the lab does not qualify. Uh, like everything else in the FAA, the paperwork matters. The lab must be a National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA lab. The form used must be the FAA form. Anything else is unacceptable. So I think the bottom line there is if you work in a safety-related aspect, you could be you know, working on the ramp, for example, at an airport. Uh, you could be a pilot, uh, possibly flight crew. All these people are subject to uh, drug testing. And even if you're not in a safety-related position that requires federal drug testing, your employer might require drug testing. And obviously, CBD oil could cause you to fail that drug test. So be aware. And I got a little backed up this week because I was on vacation, but I want to thank the several listeners who called or emailed me about uh, buying a used Cirrus. I'll be getting back to you shortly. If you are interested in buying any model of Cirrus airplane or jet or interested in flight training in one, please contact me today. Just pick up the phone. You can call me at 650-967-2500. It's a free call. Be happy to talk with you about the ins and outs of buying new versus used, as well as flight training. You can also contact me at the website. Just go to aviationnewstalk.com at the top. You can either click on contact and shoot me an email or click on listener questions if you'd like to record something for our listener questions section or for our fun flying destination section. And finally, if you would take a moment to tell your aviation friends how they can get the Aviation News Talk podcast. And if they don't know what a podcast is, and yeah, about half the people out there don't, just send them to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, and there they can download our dedicated Aviation News Talk podcast apps for iOS and Android. And in the App Store, they would just search for Aviation News Talk. And yes, of course, those apps are free. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>